and run. I suppose the most daunting thing about computers is this business of communicating with them. There's the machine, and I'm supposed to talk to it. I say talk, but it's more a matter of writing it little notes. You type little memos into it. Of course, there are a large number of what computer people call languages, but they don't seem much like any language we humans speak. In fact, you can never forget that you're talking to a machine. Fifty years ago, these steam engines and agricultural machines were in common everyday use. Today, they just beautifully preserve collectors' items. Just as they make people redundant, they in their turn were replaced. But even so, outdated as they are, we can still see at work in them the same principles on which much of today's computer technology is based. They're not really steam organs at all. It was the steam engine which drove the generator, which powered the pump, which produced the air, which made the music. Absolutely magic, brilliant. You know, if I could get it in my living room, I'd get rid of my hi-fi. You know, this was designed to replace a 60-piece orchestra. It would churn out music 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It would churn it out in any style you wanted or any tune you wanted, providing you knew how to program it. And this was a secret. A pattern of holes in a piece of cardboard. And it's the placing of these holes in their exact positions which ensures the organ plays this piece and not the national anthem. Well, tell us, Tim, how does it work? Well, I'll try to. We have a row of steel keys here, which sense the holes in the cardboard music. When a key is up, it operates an air valve inside the box here, which transmits an air signal through the tubes into the other mechanical part of the organ. Um, would you like to see how these work? Yeah, yeah which, one, which one's the drum, for example? Well, if I put this book on here, this, there, there's the drum stop there. See, number that one there, 55. I if see. I push this down now, and you move that up and down, like that, and it's a drum. That's the nice drum. That's tremendous. Not oh. too bad. It's very simple. It's a sort of early form of binary. It just is. a straight on off switch. That's all it is, yes. Very, very simple. Uh, when the key is up, the music plays. Simple as that. Oh, I really like it. Music of a very different kind from the annex of the Science Museum, the bit the public never see. It's an absolute treasure house of redundant technology. What have you found, Mac? It's a Japanese kamikaze rocket. I suppose it's the sort of executive jet they give to redundant Japanese executives. <laughs> well, look, 
This has got flashing lights and it's got Ferranti written on it, so I guess it must be a computer, is that right? Yeah, it's a bit of an oldie, but it's still a computer. Now, it's making music. Does that mean that there's any similarity between the way this makes music and the way those steam organs in uh, Lanford Forum do it? Curiously enough, there is, and I can show you it. It's, uh, it's a little bit surprising. If you look at this little device here, you remember the cards with all those holes cut mm. in it? Uh, as there were holes in the board, on, the, on those boards that went through the old steam organ, these represent the holes, these little plugs. They're actually ferrite plugs. And where there's a one, that's an on, and where there isn't one, that's an off. And each one of these running right across represents instructions. That's one, two, three, four, and so on. Each one of these, there's 24 across here, 24 on-offs, which gives you a possibility of 16 million combinations of instructions. And that's just, you can imagine it almost like that board going through the steam organ, and this is telling this computer exactly what it should do. That seems an awfully cumbersome way of running a computer, <laughs> putting little, little pins in holes. <laughs> Absolutely desperate. I mean, if anybody had to program like this days, there'd be no programmers left. It's impossible. Um, it's not like that anymore, thank goodness. And even this machine has some help to, to help you sort them out, but very, very little. And this is obviously not just designed for making music, is it? No, well, it's a general purpose computer, but this particular one was programmed to run uh, an ammonia plant, and it took temperature sensing devices which convert it to input to the machine, it took acidity and so on, fed it all into a series of programs, and these controlled, they sent messages out to control the valves that ran the whole plant. still seems a very long way from what we think of as the modern computer with its keyboard and its television set. Are they really that different? Well, the idea is very similar. In that Argus, there was a program running in the machine that would check whether I touched any switches on the front. And in this, there's one running as well. There's a program in here. What most people think of as a program, surely, is a set of instructions in the computer which say, do this, do that. In other words, making it do something. Well, as far as I can see, it's not doing anything. It's just sitting there. <laughs> well, it isn't exactly switched off because you can see the little light flashing, which means it's switched on. But yeah. in addition to that, there is a program running in there which is continuously checking whether somebody has actually pressed a key on the keyboard, and it's running all the time. Does that mean there's a little sort of electric current running backwards and forwards saying, key pressed, no, run again, key pressed, no, and uh, like that? Is that what it's Well, doing? it's not an electric current, but the idea is very similar. Mm. And I've got something I'd really like to show you because it's very much like your doorbell at home has broken down. You're expecting friends with their arms full of good cheer. How do you know when they've arrived at the door? Well, that's very clear. The machine is constantly looking to see if anybody's uh, there or not, and if they're not, they go back and keep checking. Are all computers like that? No, some actually operate more like as if you had a doorbell. In other words, as you'd be sitting at home doing something else, but subconsciously listening for the bell to ring, and as soon as they rang the bell, you'd go to the door and see if anyone was there. Some programs work like that, or some computers work like that. You hit a key, and it interrupts what's going on in the computer at that time. Now, when you press a key, I imagine a kind of electronic version of your marvellous steam organ, where, you know, a metal prong goes through there and says, ah, circuit A, open, and ah, now you press A. So it's been through all this process, little pipes and wires, and up comes A on the screen. Now, is that anything like accurate? <laughs> no, there is no connection at all between the screen and what, uh, between the keyboard and what's appearing on the screen. And I think I can show you this. I've written a little demonstration program here, and all it does is put "I am busy" on the screen. So there's now another program running inside this computer in right. here, and so the program that services the keyboard is no longer running. And you can see that because if I touch the keyboard, it doesn't do anything. Well, that's. You're absolutely stuck now. If that, that's going to go on forever. I mean, how do you stop it? Well, fortunately, we have a doorbell, or equivalent of a doorbell, and we press escape, which is the doorbell, and press it, and it stops. And we're back now to the program that's asking the keyboard, has anybody pressed a key? So if you press a key now, it'll come up on the screen? It will come right on the screen. Right. Now, what is it exactly that happens when, between the time I press that key 
and the letter comes up. Something happens in here. Well, it's quite complex. First of all, you hit a key. It will then store that character. Uh, there'll be a program in there that's checking whether a character's there. If it finds one, it will refer it to another program, and that in its turn will determine where it's going to go on the screen, whether it goes here or further along, whether it's overlapped and should go on the next line. It's quite a complex sequence of instructions it has to go through. It has a lot to do, but how long does it take? It's a lot faster than I can type. It's, it takes less than a thousandth of a second to do that. As quickly as that. It's very, very rapid. So deep down in this machine's subconscious, I mean, planted there, is the message, make A on the screen, which we, only have to, which we just have to call up by pressing the key. Is it's that right? totally routine. It just goes on and on. And I always like to think of it as, it's very complex, the individual things, but you only have to give it one instruction. It's almost like soldiers on parade, that they individually have quite complex things to do, but you can give one command and make them all turn or halt or whatever. And each soldier has planted deep down in his consciousness something that has been drilled to do. Exactly, that he, what, he wants, what he has to do in that sequence. Just carrying the military analogy a little bit farther, if I gave you a command, shoot at a target, as a trench soldier, you'd know exactly what to do. Right, yes, I mean, it just happens by an amazing coincidence. I have a rifle here, and I think, let me just see if I know what you mean. You can divide the action of simple command, like shoot, into three sort of routines. It's load, aim, and fire, and they're all of them quite complicated. Loading means opening that, stick a bullet in there, close it up again, with any luck it's loaded. Aiming means lining up, yes, clear, <laughs> there's nothing in it, but let's not take any chances. Lining up the target with the two sights on the front and back of the gun, looking through and making sure that it's all lined up. And then the firing part is another muscular activity, which is pulling the trigger finger like that. And when you're satisfied that everything's lined up properly, fire. And those are three quite complicated routines, all embodied in one very simple word, shoot at the target. In computer language, we call them subroutines, right. parts of a main routine. And perhaps I can show you, if you pass me this rather large book of uh, steam right. organ music, yeah. you'll see something of what, sorry, what, what we mean. If you look carefully at this, you can find two pieces of this music which are very similar. There's a piece here, yes. and there's a piece down here. Right. And we can think of those, they're probably just repeats of the same refrain. Well, you could take that out and take that out, and at this point, you have an instruction which says, play this section. You've just stored it once, and when it's played it, it comes back to this point on the music. We could have a command which says, play refrain, and it would play the refrain here, it would play the refrain there. In other words, that was a subroutine. And by that command of saying, play refrain, we've almost started to invent a, a computer language, even for the old steam organ. Now, we've talked about language a lot, and I must admit to being quite confused by the diversity and number of computer languages. We've got a program running here which lists the basic COBOL, Fortran, Pascal. There's an absolutely dazzling number of languages. Now, how on earth do we tell what languages they are? Presumably, they're all like French, German, Spanish, and so on. How do we tell one from another? And which oh, using your analogy of ordinary languages, for example, in, uh, in, in Eskimo, there's hundreds of names for snow because they want to talk a lot about snow. In Arabic, apparently, there's lots of names, lots of words to do with camels. And similarly, there's been attempts at computer languages to make programming easier and easier. And so many different attempts have been made, uh, specialised languages, general purpose languages, we end up with this terrible confusion. And which one are we using? We're going to use BASIC, and that is a very popular language. It's a popular language for people to start learning how to program. And this particular machine runs in BASIC. And most microcomputers work on BASIC, do they? Yes, they do. Almost every microcomputer would have a BASIC. And although it's the most popular, it has certain problems with it. First of all, it's very easy to make mistakes in BASIC. And secondly, there isn't really a standard BASIC that you can use on every microcomputer. They're all in some way a little bit different. If we wanted to use a different language on this, could we? Yes, there's a much more professional language called Pascal, which is a much more disciplined language. It's more um, rigorous and it's, it's more difficult to make mistakes and it's also more transportable but more difficult to learn. Yes, and it's, for a beginner it will be more difficult to learn. So that's why for a beginner, many of them start off in BASIC. And BASIC, which is running on our microcomputer here, was originally designed to make programming easy to learn for people like me. But there are other, less common languages which have been designed for doing very special jobs. Jill Neville. This is what engineers call a drive shaft, and you'll find one like it in most heavy vehicles and most heavy machinery. 
Though it's a complicated shape, full of curves and angles, with a thread top and bottom, it can be made in just four minutes from a plain steel bar like this one. What's more, it can be made on a general purpose lathe, which could equally well be turning out bolts or pipe fittings. Modern lathes are, of course, very sophisticated pieces of machinery, and for some time they've been fully automated. But it's only with the growing need for flexibility that they've actually been controlled by computer. But of course, you can't just stand a computer by a lathe and expect it to turn out components. Someone's got to tell it what to do. Peter, how do you get it across to a computer that it's now in charge of a very complicated lathe? Well, first of all, this computer, same as any other computer, needs a main program so it can understand it's got a lathe on the other end of it. From a simple set of instructions, the spindle and chuck arrangement can be made to revolve at the required speed. The, cu the cutting tools can be made to brought into position and cut the shape required for that particular component. Uh, the tail stock can be brought in to support the work or from the instructions. Now let's go back to the computer itself. If I've got this drive shaft in my hand and I want another one, how do yes. I tell the computer that that's what I want? First of all, there's a set of instructions written and punched out on a paper tape, which are then stored in the memory of the computer. And the first instruction tells the, uh, the machine that it's going to run in metric units. G71 means metric. M42 means a gear change. So each of those is really a code for a rather specific process? That's right. Each line or block is to do that. We can perhaps look a little bit further along in the program. G96 means a constant cutting speed. So it means this, the material is being cut at a constant rate. So what you've got here is a very simple code unlocking a whole sequence of, of, of actions which is already stored in the memory. drive shaft like this, you need a special language, a form of code if you like. The language may seem strange at first, but it's easy to learn. And though its applications are limited elsewhere, here on the factory floor, it's exactly the right tool for the job. Well, controlling complicated machines like that one is something that computers are increasingly being used for. Mm, everybody's seen film of robots putting cars together. Well, we've got a small robot here. It's kind of little brother. But although it's only an arm, it's still capable of a surprisingly wide range of movements. Now, Mac, what do I have to do with a computer to make it instruct the arm to do what I want it to do? Well, the arm is capable of 12 different sorts of movements, left, right, up, down, open, close, and so on. And each one of those movements is controlled by a program that we could store in the computer in what we call a, a subroutine. And presumably that subroutine is written in a kind of language that the arm understands and we probably wouldn't. Right. right. So that, that means we've got to write a little interpreter so we can put in English commands to make the arm do just what we want it to do. OK. Now, there's the beginnings of a program here. We've got to print command question mark, which is fairly clear. When you run the program, you get the word command question mark coming up on the screen. That's easy. It's asking you for a command. The next bit is input command string, which tells the computer to expect a string of letters which will put together a command word. Right. right. Now, what's the next step? Well, the next step is to make that, that word that you've put in select out the appropriate subroutine that's going to make the arm do what you want it to do. For mm -hmm. example, if you want it to go up. So... It's going to be one of those if-then things, isn't That's it? That's right, going to, yes. You're going to write, the next instruction, I bet, is going to be if um, the command string equals up, for instance, then find the subroutine that says up. Right, that's precisely correct. But you can't write it quite that way in basic, not quite, but very similar. So you say, if the command string equals up, then get the subroutine, which starts at line 1,000, where we've put all this code that makes the arm You could go put up. it on any line, but you'd you could start in any 1,000 is a sort right. of convenient size And number. you don't actually say go to subroutine. You shorten that and say go sub. So you just say go sub 1,000, which is where the That's one of those bits of, of basic language, is. isn't it? Yeah. Yes. OK. So the next line is going to be 30. Who would have guessed it? And if... String, that funny dollar sign... Equals, yes. not is isn't allowed, it's got to be equals, um, well, let's say up. In quotes. In, in quotes. 
then, very important, then... Um, go sub. G-O-S-U-B. That's it. Yeah. A thousand. I just write the number a thousand. One thousand, that's it. That's where that particular subroutine starts. That's its first line. Well, instead of typing them all in, we have to do one for every movement of the arm. And we've got our labour-saving <laughs> tape, <laughs> so it's all been done for us. Right, splendid. And we can load this now. Let me get this right. Um, uh, and what's it called? Um, robot. In, in, oh, right. in, in, in quotes. Qu um, start Switch the tape running, and then press the return key, and that's it's searching. Searching now. for the program, okay. and then it'll begin. Now it's beginning to read it in. Right. And of course, it, on the cassette, it's quite slow. It takes a bit of time to get it in. It will be a lot quicker on disc, but they cost correspondingly more. Little right. floppy disks. Right. And it's now actually reading through the program, which is all on there, and, and absorbing it into it's the computer once again. It's reading every one of those subroutines yeah. that uh, control the movements of the arm, and also our little interpreter, which we can type in commands in ordinary English, which is make the arm do what we want it to do. Right. Well, any second now, with any luck, the tape, when the tape's played its all into the computer, we should be able to... No, we're no. right at it now. We can, so uh, let's list it and make sure it's in. I'll list the first bit so we can look at okay. our... Um, it's in the first nine lines, which is our little interpreter. So list 10 to 90, 10 comma 90. 10 comma 90. Right. That's a bit more basic jargon, is it? If we said list the whole lot, we'd have all the subroutines. Oh, I see. Out. But okay. comma instead of dash. That's it. it. Okay. And there it is. If command up, then goes to the 1,000 down, mm. is it starts at 2,000, left starts at 3,000. Right. And so we can try it out and see if it works. Right, you can run it. Oh, great. What is your command, O oh, master? Well, let's, <laughs> shall we try it on up and see what happens? Well, it works. Wonderful. What's the next command? Left, shall we try? That's tremendous. That's <laughs> absolutely <laughs> terrific. We've made it go. It's very gratifying. But, of course, these words don't mean anything to the computer. We can change them to use any words we like. Really? We don't have to we use could... up or left or anything. So we could just... We could call the up command George or Mac <laughs> yes, or well, anything. let's do it. Okay. We have to escape from the programme and get back to where we were, so there we go. And now we should listen and see. Okay. 10 to 90. Comma 90. Comma 90. Has to be, doesn't it? Right. Well, there's the command for up number 30. If we retype 30. it, right. and we can put anything We can just you retype like. it down there. Yes, it doesn't matter, it. and it'll still take... OK. Right. Um, if command string equals anything you like... Well, let's say Mac, shall oh, we? Oh, that's very nice. <laughs> then goes to the 1,000, which is simply going to take us right into that subroutine which starts at instruction okay. 1,000. We can run it now, can we? That's him. Run. Come on. <laughs> oh, master. <laughs> what is your command, oh, master? Well, look here, arm. I want you to go Mac, M-A-C. Go. Great. It works. So I suppose what we're actually saying is that <laughs> the arm only speaks a kind of arm language, and if we speak English or any other language, we have to have an interpreter to convert what we speak into what makes that thing go. Yes, the great advantage of it is, of course, you can type anything, you, you can create it to be anything you like. You could put L there, or you could put it in French or German or anything you like. Right.